Hey everyone, this is Mr. Conway, and this video is going to be on your other senses, including your sense of smell, your sense of taste, and also um, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, gate control theory of pain. And this will finish up sensation for our class. So I'm starting off at 4.4 other senses, printed page 141. And I'm going to click to the next page, and I'm going to kind of skip over, let's see, what do we want to talk about with touch? Okay, we talked about your, um, I guess this would be a good time, we can talk about the your other senses. Okay, remember I told you that you've been essentially lied to your whole life, you have way more than five senses, but the two that we're going to look at are your um, kinesthesis and your vestibular sense. Okay, Kines your kinesthetic sense is going to be how uh, you sense your um, your body parts and the position of your body kind of in the world. And when we we did this when we were standing, um, when you closed your eyes and you touched your um, your nose without looking, um, the book. Your textbook talks about people feeling disembodied, which is actually what I'm reading about, um, where it says uh, Sachs 1985. That's a, the book by Oliver Sachs, uh, where this this woman, um, this says that it was a, a man, but the, the, um, the one that I'm reading is about a woman that feels disembodied. Now, that doesn't mean that her body, like it feels, when you, you may have a different, um, image that comes to mind of somebody who's disembodied, but it just means that uh, they don't have any idea of where they are in space or they don't have control over their, their limbs. So the woman had to look at her arm to make it do what she wanted it to do. She couldn't just have a sense of where it is. So she felt like that her body wasn't hers. So your kinesthetic sense of being able to know where your body limbs are is something that we probably take for granted. Um, the other one's going to be the vestibular sense, and this is your sense of balance. This is why um, when we spun around in circles, it kind of uh, it messed with our sense of balance. And that's because you have something in your ears called your vestibular sacs and your semicircular canals. Okay, the vestibular sacs are going to be filled with fluid, kind of like a level that you buy at Lowe's to see if something is straight. And when that fluid gets sloshed around from you spinning around or going on a roller coaster or simply putting your head down um, and then you come back up and you feel dizzy, that's because that fluid rotates or tilts. And so sometimes that's it's like a sensor telling your body that it needs to get back into position and restore the balance to it. Okay. Um, now, for the, the other thing about touch is going to be the gate control theory of pain. So I'm on printed page 142. And the only thing um, that really you should that we kind of need to take away from this is the gate control theory. Okay, this is the only theory of pain that you're going to be asked about that we're going to talk about. And what it does is it, it it's, it's a metaphor. Okay, it's not actually a gate that is in your body, but... It says that the spinal cord kind of acts like a gate and it can block certain pain signals and it can prioritize certain pain signals to be sent to the brain. So if you look at this picture of figure 4.24, you can see this person about to step on a tack, which is going to create a uh, large amount of pain probably. And so what happens is that gets sent up the spinal cord to go to the brain and you actually have a gate that can allow that pain or it can block it. Um, the gate is opened by certain pain signals that come into the brain. Okay. Um, now, you don't need to kind of jump too far into this. In fact, just understanding that the gate control theory lets some pain signals in um, prioritizes pain signals, that's really going to be all that, um, and, and, and knowing that that's the pain theory um, should suffice. Um, I don't really go into much detail when I'm, um, you know, when I take these tests, I, don't, I never see much about the uh, gate or about pain other than the gate control theory. And it's never really trying to figure out the, the ins and outs of it. It's just um, what is the, a lot of times it's a very easy recall question about um, what is the theory that allows pain signals to the brain and you'd have to select gate control theory. Okay. Okay. Let's look at taste. All right. 
Um, this is going to be pretty quick. Um, I believe this is where the sensory interaction word is, which we've talked about. This is where your senses work with each other and they rely on each other. And uh, the most common one is your sense of taste and your sense of smell. So when you can't smell, it's going to be really hard to to taste. And, and when you um, take away your sense of sight, it's going to be hard to to, to um, identify things just by hearing them. Okay. So a lot of the test questions are going to be, um, let's see, what is a good one for sensory interaction? It probably would be about having a cold and you can't taste your food. I think that is the test question. Okay. Um, for, for taste though, uh, there's not really much. It has your, um, oh, there is a biological reason for having these, um, basic taste functions. So if you look at table 4.2, it's got the basic survival, uh, the survival functions of basic taste. So we have sweet, salty, sour, bitty, and umami. Uh, the umami is the most uh, is a kind of a recent one um, that detects. Um, it's like a very meaty, protein-rich flavor. But um, the big, the one I really want to focus on is is bitter. Okay, and sour. So the reason why. Um, we don't like sour things. And I'm not talking about Sour Patch Kids or Sour Skittles because those are coated in sugar to go along with it. But like truly thing, things that are truly bitter, it's an innate, remember, innate means you're born with it. We have an innate aversion, which means we don't like bitter or sour things. And you can see because sour and bitter things are potentially toxic poisons. So if you give a little kid a lemon, a lot of times it's really popular to do and, and all the adults laugh at the little baby, but what they're doing is they're giving the baby something that the baby thinks is poisonous and the baby makes a face and spits it out. Um, and that's just, that's a biological preparedness thing. That That's something that we're, we're born with. It's an instinct that's innate. You know, we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to like bitter things. Okay. Um, it's think about it. If you're, you know, bitter, bitter, um, like berries that you might find, you know, they say don't eat anything in the wild and, and it's cause it could be poisonous. All right. So, um, um, and things that are sweet as you know, sugar will give us energy, uh, with like carbohydrates, Okay, and you can look at some of those other reasons, but um, yeah, that that's really the only thing that's going to be about about taste. Um, and then we have the papillas, the tiny little taste buds on our tongue. Um, that's what those are called. All right, let's look at smell. I'm at four point four point four, printed page one forty eight. All right, so smell. I'm going to teach you a new word, and some of y'all already know it, but it is called uh, olfaction. You can see it right there in, the, the, um, in that paragraph under how do we experience smell, O-L-F-A-C-T-I-O-N. You need to know that word, know that it is synonymous with smell, olfaction, olfactory. Anything that looks like that, it's going to be your sense of smell, okay? Now, this picture right here, uh, figure 4.28, this kind of goes into detail about the transduction process. Um, and how, you know, we have little neurons that detect these, um, all these odor molecules and it goes into your nose and then it gets converted into, uh, an electrical signal and then gets transmitted to the brain. Okay. Not, I'm only going to focus on things that are, you know, high priority. This is not high priority, the process of, of how we smell, but it is kind of interesting. Um, it's kind of gross too, because when you smell stuff, you're, you're literally particles of whatever you're smelling go into your nose. Um, so you can kind of use your imagination with that. Okay. Um, but know that that is the, um, olfactory sense and olfaction. Okay. Uh, there's some interesting things in this reading about, um, why, um, your smell is, is, uh, it's, it's actually, Ooh, I do want to actually give you one thing. It is a, um, your sense of smell is going to be, I believe a chemical sense. Okay. Um, it is chemical. It is actually tied to your, um, your memories. So kind of where your memories are stored. Um, so where your temporal lobe is, um, it's not far from where your olfactory sense, sense, uh, sensory information gets gets sent. And so um, if you've ever smelled something and it triggers a memory, it's because it's actually in um, 
kind of the same part of the brain. So that's pretty cool too. Um, but I think, let's see if there's anything else about smell that I want to mention. I think that's it. Um, I feel like you might want to look at taste being chemical. I think those are the two chemical smells that you need to know. Um, yeah, okay, perfect, right here, second paragraph. Whew. Like taste, smell is a chemical sense. Okay, so those are your two chemical senses. Also, um, remember that the thalamus detects um, or it receives all sensory information except for smell. So um, it actually sends it to the um, straight to your temporal lobe and to the parts of the limbic system like the hippocampus and the amygdala. Okay, so this one actually bypasses the thalamus for smell. So pretty interesting. Okay, I think that's going to be it. I'm going to, uh, I'll see you on the next video about um, perceptual, um, perceptual organization. See ya.